uh, hello, welcome to, to our panel about uh, why we need more open source hardware and software for health applications. I'm happy to have you all here and very grateful that Fosh Elsha gave us a chance to hold this panel. I'm very pleased to have all these engaged panelists here and that I'm very happy and uh, thank you so much for coming from all over the world here to our common panel discussion. Okay, we want to speak about our work and I'm happy to introduce Ren Wen Sang, who is Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication and New Media at the National University of Singapore, dedicated to building bridges across disciplines and solve big problems such as healthcare and social injustice. And Karen Sandler the, is the Executive Director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, former Executive Director of the GNOME Foundation and much more. She's going to introduce herself later like all of us, and Daniel Vesolek, uh, who is Tangible Interaction Designer and Electronic Artist and Co-Initiator of the Open Source Prototype Fund Hardware. And Joel Murphy, with a background in Kinetic Sculpture, Citizen Engineer and Career Hacker, now heading the Community Building and Commercialization Teams of the OS Hearing Aid Hardware prototype Timpan and is also co-founder of OpenBCI Biosensing Boards and Pulse Sensor.com. And my name is Peggy Sillop, I'm computer scientist, master of public policy and artist, founder of Packlab Days and initiator of the Open Hearing Project, uh, open source hearing aid development. So I give the first introduction word to Ren Wen. Please introduce yourself, say a bit about your work. Hey everyone, um, thanks uh, Patty for the great introduction. It's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, exchange ideas, uh, have discussion with all the Stella uh, panel members here. So my name is Ren Wen Zhang. Um, and um, as I'm currently an assistant professor at National University of Singapore, so I got my PhD in communication studies from Northwestern University last year. And my PhD work has largely focused on uh, digital technologies for promoting well-being and mental health. So um, my research mainly focuses on, um, you know, uh, designing uh, and evaluating the use and effects of uh, mobile health apps and social media uh, for um, enhancing mental well-being. And I've worked closely with clinical psychologists and um, uh, computer scientists and designers uh, to design and evaluate a suite of mobile apps for treating depression and anxiety, uh, and also evaluated uh, the effectiveness and efficacy of these apps uh, um, uh, in the uh, among people with dep depression anxiety, both in the clinic and in the community, so it is uh, it was uh, like through this this research experience that I started thinking about the importance of uh, open source data as well as open source software, um, especially in the field of uh, mental wellness. Um, so. First of all, I um, after I came to Singapore, I've started building collaborations with uh, local hospitals and some psychiatrists and psychologists uh, to develop uh, uh, mobile health apps for uh, health um, like that can fit the age context and particularly the single context. And we um, uh, went through uh, the process of um, understanding all the regulations uh, governing the development of mobile health apps, and then we realized that uh, the regu the local regulations are um, really strict. So if we want to develop something from scratch, it can um, take a, a super long time, and then sometimes um, you know it can t take years for an app to be approved um, by the regulatory uh, body. So I think this uh, might be the case for for many uh, countries, and not only for Singapore. Um, so that prompted me to think about the importance of leveraging open source uh, mobile health apps uh, that can be uh, tested and mod modified by developers um, so as to fit in local languages and local cultures, um, especially 
in a developing world as well as global south. Because uh, a lot of the existing mobile house apps are de are developed in um, uh, developed countries in the Western world, uh, and but these apps may not fit into the local uh, culture and social context in other parts of the world. And also, um, another thought I have um, is regarding the importance of having an open uh, data repository uh, uh, for identifying biomarkers uh, surrounding. Uh, health and in particular mental health um, and then this kind of open data repository can help us to uh, build uh, uh, machine learning models that are more comprehensive, equitable um, and um, transparent um, so that we are able to identify uh, this biomarker that uh, associated with symptoms of depression and anxiety uh, you know um, in a concerted group. Uh, those are the two uh, thoughts uh, I have, and uh, I look forward to uh, learning more from other panelists and also exchange, uh, exchange ideas. So that's all for me, and I'll pass to Karen. Hi, everybody. Um, so I am uh, Karen Sandler. I'm the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy and a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School. And I come at these issues from a perspective of a patient because I have a heart condition um, where I have a very thick heart. It's called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying, but it's OK because I have an implanted device, a pacemaker defibrillator, and it monitors my heart. And if I get into a dangerous rhythm, it will shock me. Um, and to deliver life-saving technology, which is fantastic. Uh, but uh, being an engineer turned lawyer, um, I, as soon as I was prescribed with this device, I wanted to see the source code in my own body. And that was a very difficult exercise to undertake. Uh, the manufacturers were not willing to, um, to share that with me. And so I went on this, uh, this big journey where at first I thought that the issues were really important about software transparency and that we should have the right to see the software in our bodies, and we do. Uh, but as I live with my defibrillator, I learned that it's not just about transparency. When I was pregnant, um, my heart palpitated, which is super normal for, uh, for women who are pregnant. About a, a quarter to a third of all uh, pregnant women have palpitations. And so I had palpitations, which was totally normal, except that because I had a defibrillator, my defibrillator thought that I was in danger. And so it unnecessarily and inappropriately shocked me repeatedly to save my life, which I did not need. And the only way to reliably stop it from doing that was to take drugs to slow my heart rate down, but it was hard to walk up a flight of stairs. And so like this was such an like a way, like eye opening. It was shocking, an eye opening issue because uh, it uh, it it really underscored the fact that um, our technology may not be used in the ways that the manufacturers expect. When I think about it, only fifteen percent of the people who get defibrillators are under the age of sixty five, and only about forty two percent total are women anyway. And so the number of people who are pregnant with defibrillators is a teeny tiny subset. Now. Device manufacturers have no desire for pregnant ladies to get shocked, right? It's like literally their worst nightmare. But it stands for the, this proposition that, you know, I, like despite all the best intentions, my use case wasn't anticipated. And the only way that our software will be safe and reliable in the long term is if we, the public, we as patients, um, we are able to take collective action and are able to control our technology. Because it's not a matter of if her software will fail, it's when it will fail. And what matters is what can we do about it when it does fail. And so I work at Software Freedom Conservancy to help promote alternatives to proprietary software, um, to enforce and stand up for copy left licenses so we have the tools to bring freedom to other people. And then also we run a diversity initiative where we do paid remote internships to people who are subject to systemic bias and who are impacted by underrepresentation in tech. Because if our tech is not made by everybody for everyone, then we're going to have these situations over and over again where we have use cases where we don't anticipate. And so I'm really passionate about these issues in software freedom. And I come at things from like a, 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 a practical nonprofit. What can we do as the public and also from a legal perspective? And I'm so excited to talk to all of you. Oh, and I'm going to pass it to Daniel. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm also super interested in this uh, question because I'm 
Yeah, I'm an artist by training, but I'm doing like open hardware more and more and also quite active here in Germany to promote this uh, prototype fund for hardware and was working in different projects like Carables, where we were trying to co-design solutions, individual solutions with people that needed them. And so, so I have a strong interest in designing these things and I think innovation can go much faster, especially if one develops for the people directly and doesn't need to uh, yeah, wait for certification and all these things and issues. So I th think it's a very important thing that there are a lot of things that are open hardware and I think on the other side it's also difficult to figure out how yeah, like, are there boundaries or something like, like for example, a defibrillator? Uh, sorry, um, like, like of course you don't want this not to work in the right, in the wrong moment or something. So, so maybe one could say, okay, it would be maybe wrong that people can change things in there. But at the same time, um, there's this example of this retina implant, where the company went bankrupt and suddenly you have a device that. that got turned off or you can't do anything anymore and that would be super helpful if it was an open hardware device because then you could actually work with people to, to fix it and to still see something with the implant that you already have in your body. So so I think there are like different sides to the to the story and in general I I'm more on the side that I think open hardware in this field has a lot of benefits and maybe there are some things where one should restrict it or something but I'm not super sure about it and I think fighting for openness <laughs> is, is good and then if there are things then one needs to figure out solutions. Yeah, and I'll hand over to Joel. Thanks Daniel, thanks Peggy for having us uh, on the panel. Um, and my name is Joel Murphy and I am uh, in the deep dark past I was a kinetic sculptor I'm an uh, electronics design engineer, and I have uh, been working on building sustainable open source hardware companies. I make Pulse Sensor, which is an optical heart rate monitor for Arduino, which is not a medical device. And <coughs> I've co-founded OpenBCI, which is an open source EEG device, which is, again, not a medical device. And I'm currently working on uh, a project called Timpin, which is funded by the National Institute of Health here in the U.S. and the National Institute of Deafness and Communication Disorders, which is a tool called a master hearing aid, and that's the hardware that you run your hearing aid algorithms on for research and testing, user testing, this kind of stuff. Um, that's called Timpin, and that's been ongoing now since 2016, 2017. That is also not a medical device. Um, I'm sort of skirting the edges of the medical device hardware world. During the pandemic, when here in New York, when we had our first surge of um, uh, sicknesses and deaths, um, there was a push to create um, uh, hardware solutions, especially uh, respirators. <clears throat> I was working with a team to create an open source respirator. Um, which never wound up being open source in the end because the regulatory hurdles are too high, the costs of making this thing are too high. And in a lot of cases, open source technology, actual microchips, are not recommended for life-saving applications. So you have to be really careful about how you make something if you want it to be, uh, to, to be used as a medical device. Um, and I'm very interested in this sort of line and this boundary between what regulations will require and how open can devices be for, of course, all the reasons that both Karen and Ren said. Um, so I'm really fascinated in, about this conversation. I'm looking forward to discussing it with you.
So, thank you, Joel. Thank you, Karen, Renvan, Daniel. It's really interesting. All your work is really fascinating, absolutely interesting. I'm really happy that we have this discussion here. So, I want to introduce myself a bit. So, uh, I have uh, hearing loss myself, and I come from sound art, and uh, I tried uh, 2016, my first hearing aid, and I was saying, oh, wow, this sounds really bad. There's no interface. I have no control about my medical device. I'm suddenly... Uh, I'm somebody, I have a problem suddenly and I'm a patient and in that moment other people tell me what's good for me hearing, you know, nobody cares about when you go on streets and you listen to really loud music, nobody cares, but in the moment you are, you need an aid, people tell you that's the right noise and that must be like this and for most people hearing aids are too loud and uh, I thought I have to do something about it. So, and um, I decided that we need self-fitting pop, uh, the self-adjustment of hearing aids. And I started the, the first open source citizen science project at Fraunhofer ITMT uh, in Oldenburg in Germany. And what we did, we did actually put open source hearing aid algorithms, open MHA, of the open MHA on, on a Raspberry Pi and put some interface on it and walk made sound walks, which is, comes up from uh, also sound art, uh, going on streets and actively listening to what you like, what you don't like, and self-adjust the sound like you wish it, like, like full control in, in, the, um, in the hands of, of the user. And it came actually out, and it's also, in the meanwhile, I know it's also a scientific study says that most people uh, think that hearing aids are too loud and they make it softer and uh, yeah in the end I'm still working at this project um, the, the research project stop but I but I have a new project the open hearing project and we, we want to put this this like scientific research prototype and in on an Android app uh, we are still looking for some support, so if you feel like uh, helping me, just contact me. And uh, says basically the idea is to give the chance to have full control about your hearing aid algorithms, which is not possible on a normal hearing aid. And um, yeah, why is it so important? Because it is also a scientific studies in me, while I also saying that uh, the personal um, need of amplification is not relying so much about your ability on hearing. So some people like it a bit louder, some like it a bit softer, some like it like higher uh, frequencies, others like more like low frequencies. That's one thing. And I found also all, uh, in my studies that every person has a very single way of adjusting the sound. And um, this is also, which is also confirmed on one way and on the other way. Uh, most hearing aid tests, also there are some sorts of hearing um, problems which can't be tested in a conventional hearing test. Also one thing is you test it in a laboratory only, which has nothing to do with the real world. Mm -hmm. And also the hearing aid is adjusted in the laboratory, which has nothing to do with real world. And you get out and it's like, wow, wow, it's too loud, too much. And meanwhile, it's better, but that time was really bad. I have to say, meanwhile, I am, I'm just testing some quite cool hearing aids, I have to say. Um, and uh, the other thing is there is something like a sudden hearing loss, which you get after you had a very loud sound. And then you get hyperacusis, which you get hypersensitive to hearing, uh, to, to sounds. And there is no hearing test made for this, for example. And then uh, in the moment you can adjust yourself, you're, perf you're perfect. You can, you can do it in the loudness you like, and you can stand, you know, and, I even have, and so I, I had this very simple uh, hearing aid uh, prototype, and um, I was actually just for people with soft to moderate hearing loss, like me, and actually I have still like a very elderly fanboy who's, who's using this big Raspberry Pi box in daily life and has really severe hearing loss. Why does he use it? It's because when you get hearing loss, you... Um, you don't hear softer, softer sounds because you're not able to. And when they're getting too loud, it's, it's uh, the ear's not dynamic. It's really like crashing your brain easily. So it must be the the worst you're hearing is the last, the less, uh, you know, let's say, space you have in loudness where you can, which you can stand. 
And on the other hand, it's also so uh, that that the frequencies you, you still can perceive, they are getting less and less. So it's perfectly if you can just like steer into that, let's say, area of, of hearing you still have and steer exactly there by self-adjustment, just the hearing aid. So this is somehow already made, but I uh, in, uh, tried also by hearing um, manufacturers, but not perfectly. And I still think that open source is the right way to one makes this give more control on to, to the user, to, to the uh, impaired person on one side and on the other side. There's also uh, um, one big issue of connectivity, also connected with Bluetooth and hearing aids. And it is, uh, I would think, an open source would be would make it much more easy. For example, uh, hearing aid have a special Bluetooth format, so it's for normal most hearing aids it's impossible to connect with a with uh, with a um, laptop for. Um, for example, for now, for, for something like video conferences, and it makes it really complicated. So you have your um, your headphones above your hearing aids, and then they get to, into acoustical feedback and start to make strange noises. So it's really like there's a lot of like uh, usability and also basic needs, which are very individual. And also, what I think uh, Karen has also similar addressing a similar problem about uh, how you feel um, when with your individual problem and what do you think actually why it's so important to do um, to use open source to, to open this up I would be very interested to hear about more uh, more about that uh, from you yeah I mean it's kind of funny right because we're uh, Joel's making this distinction between uh, you know, medical devices and wellness devices, and um, and Daniel is alluding to this as well about like when is it right to be able to modify your own device? And I'm in a funny situation with a a, a, a heart device where, you know, I want to make sure that my device is very secure. <laughs> I want to make sure that uh, that no one can simply tamper with my device. Uh, but at the same time, it there is real benefit when patients can engage in their own healthcare and. Currently, the situation with most medical devices is that the manufacturers have total control over these devices. And in fact, in many cases, you need a technician um, with that company in order to be able to modify even the settings on your devices. Um, and it varies across the different medical devices and the tools that they have to do that. Um, but what I've, what, what's, what's, what I've found is that people conflate the issues of security with the issues of, um, around um, transparency, openness, and modifiability. And so um, we are at this point where studies have long shown that security through obscurity, that is security through not publishing your source code, simply does not work, right? There's all software is vulnerable um, because the software has not been disclosed does not make your software less vulnerable to attack or to failure. And so software through obscurity, uh, sorry, security through obscurity simply does not work and having free and open source software means that when there's a problem, um, you don't have to first wait for a company to admit there's a problem and then make a change. Um, there are some actions that you can take, um, you know, in independently or collectively. And so even if I wouldn't want to modify the software to my device, I would like to take collective action. I'd like to work with whatever medical professional I want to. I want to be in a situation where those um, uh, those uh, eye implants that I think Daniel was referring to, um, a, a fascinating article, company goes out of business, it was like a startup, amazing technology, people were able to see who couldn't see before. And it was like just amazing technology that is literally implanted into people's eyes. And then the company goes out of business, they stop providing security updates, they start, stop providing updates. And eventually one day, people who could see could stop seeing. I mean, just this just this tragedy and it, it it it's it's you know it's one of those situations where the patients are just helpless there's nothing that they can do there's no one they can work with companies out of business they are out of luck if you have transparency if you have um, structures of open hardware and open source software you are in the situation if you have your software freedom then you can work with somebody else all those patients can get together pool their resources so that they can work on being able to see again. And so these are not theoretical things. I mean, we've been talking about them a long time from a hypothetical perspective, and we're only now starting to see the actual results of, of, of this. And so um, 
you know, I, I, I think like if we focus on things like the insulin pump space, where kids who have diabetes are getting help from technical from their parents who are able to modify their insulin pumps to have more precise insulin delivery, it's going off book with respect to the device manufacturers. They strongly recommended against it. But um, there's Open APS has great data about kids who there was one kid who had to go to the doctor's office like almost every day he went to school. And when he started using Open APS, it was reduced dramatically, orders of magnitude, um, where this kid had a much, much healthier life. And if you have better treatment early, you're going to have a much better outcome for your life. And so we have concrete situations where being able to take control of medical devices by patients or by parents or even just by having more flexibility with your medical professionals can make a life or death change. I agree totally. I agree totally. What do you think, Daniel? What 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 can hardware development do to to uh, how do you say to boost more medical devices to to be done, to be open, uh, to make them possible? Uh, what what kind of fields do you see as hardware developer? you can what can you do for for this idea yeah like like in karen's example i find it so uh staggering <laughs> that basically uh because you have this device you have to take medication uh in order to calm the device <laughs> basically and that's totally absurd and i think there are a lot of like big and weird things that that shouldn't be like this and i think open hardware can help but there's also this whole field of not like not life saving necessary devices that are just more like in the space of like helping you like like there are things that are a problem when you have certain disabilities or something and it's and makes your life a pain and it's a very good space also to develop these things that wouldn't necessarily be like medical aids or something but just help people in their specific situation individually and there's a lot of like co-design processes that we worked on in a project called Match My Maker and also in Carabills, um where it's about, for example, okay, you're in the wheelchair, you have like a like a um, backpack hanging there, but, but you can't easily pull it. So can there be a device that helps you to, to easily pull the backpack in front of you in order to then open it and take something out and put something in and then, then it slides away, for example. So there, there's a lot of things that uh, really are helpful solutions and and I think it's 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 very great if there's a big repository of things where you can use these things and then modify it again and yeah find solution for your personal needs and space basically and maybe another thought in the bigger industry is that also through this experimentation you can come up with new solutions that wouldn't be invented so quickly because like I don't know there is some braille device that maybe has been developed like 25 years ago or something and it has certification and it's being sold and and so on so there's no need to to change anything but but like if you come up with something new now with all the technology G that's available now you could maybe create something better and so so I think it can also inspire uh, bigger companies or people that are willing through to go through all these certification processes to make better products. So you think uh, open source prototyping can be uh, inspiration for, let's say, uh, professional companies uh, to for create more creative and more like a uh, need, I say, um, need related uh, devices. What do you think, Joel? Uh, you're working in that field quite a while. Uh, what what is your experience? How much could you help? What what could you? What's your uh, positive feedback you got from your engagement? Um, well, I I would say definitely that um, having open source tools uh, accelerates innovation. Um, part of the um, original intent of projects like OpenBCI and the Timpin project are to lower the barrier of entry for people to engage with the technology 
outside of a laboratory or uh, a medical situation or research situation. Um, if you have people in their garage, for example, you know, measuring brain waves or playing around with novel hearing aid algorithms, those people are going to ask questions that are different than what scientists and researchers ask. So from the very beginning, we're dealing with opening up the space and having um, sort of a, a, a people engaging with questions or problems from a sideways angle or a different angle. And that already creates innovation in the space. Now, whether that leads to something or not is always a question. Um, but so I, I'm, of course, a firm believer that open source tools will uh, make things in a lot of ways better. And, you know, when people have access to these kinds of tools, then um, their lives become better. Just educating yourself about stuff is, uh, is improvement. Um, I think that there's, there's a really interesting edge that we're riding when we're talking about open source um, medical devices. Because when we say open source, that means that you can see the code, you can see the hardware, you can modify it. You can repurpose it. You can retool it. But if your tool is designed to give you a special shock or uh, a drug dose or diagnose something, and then you go around messing with it, you may be destroying the ability for it to actually perform correctly according to whatever the research and the doctors really require it to do. And I would say that, you know, allowing, um, allowing mods, allowing people to interact with the tech and change settings could be useful. That could be a useful way of opening up partially in a way that will be access that they need to, to make customized changes to suit themselves. But when you open this stuff up way too far by making things completely open, you're inviting people to hurt themselves in some way. Um, I, yeah, I see you waving your hands around. That's great. Yeah, this is a good conversation. Um, I, and we also have a strata of technical ability. You know, someone's a software engineer. Okay, maybe they can go through and like write in some new source code to provide a functionality that doesn't exist to a piece of medical hardware. But what if someone has no skills at all and they're, they're locked out from all of that by their own inability to access. So, you know, we're talking about a lot of different layers of complexity. Um, I'll hand it off to Peggy again. Daniel, why did you wave your hands? Thank, thank you to all, Trent. I, I, I would first like to hear Karen yeah, because, because she raised her hand. I was just waving my hand, but I can say afterwards. I don't think it matters which of us speaks first. I suspect we're getting to a similar point, which is that I, I think that uh, these issues are complicated, as you say. We need real security, right? Proper encryption, like proper security on our medical devices so they're not accidentally modified by people who don't know what they're doing, right? People need to work with their medical professionals to make sure that they have the right treatment for them. I have some heart medication that I take. It's mostly preventative. I take it every day. Um, I could easily, and sometimes I do, tweak the amount that I take. Now, I do that upon the advice of my doctor. I could easily take two or three or four times the amount of that drug um, and experiment with myself. And there's no regulation on that, right? There's no nothing stopping me from doing that, but I don't because it's my health and I work with a medical professional. And I think that there's like, it, it, these issues are not necessarily unique to, um, to hardware and software, but I think a lot of times we're so scared that people will inappropriately modify their devices that we forget that we have the ability to hurt ourselves in myriad ways in a variety of things across every moment that we live and that people to some extent have to live wisely and work in, concert with their medical professionals and then make sure that our devices have the appropriate safeguards so that people who don't know what they're doing can't accidentally modify them. Daniel, I don't know if you were going in the same direction. Yeah, exactly. Like, like I just think like, like it's also really a, a short anecdote. Like um, 
for example, if you're in a wheelchair and you have an electric wheelchair, um, like friends of mine, and then um, it's not your device because it's paid for by the health insurance. So the health insurance owns it, but but you spend like 24 or like minus the time you're sleeping, you spend in this device. So it's basically part of your body, like like you, it's body augmentation. And then you have like a simple request that you would like to have like a charger for your phone on there, for example. And then it's not possible because there's like because it's not your device, you can't do anything. So 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 it's so it becomes very strange quickly. And then there are these workarounds that that of course it's easy to connect a um, cigarette lighter like these old electric cigarette lighters to a wheelchair because that's something that I don't know someone fought for at in, at some point in time. And then you can take an adapter and then it's easy to solve the problem. So so I think the more freedom people have the better and and I don't think that the developers will be able to anticipate all the problems that might come up so so I think it's from my perspective it's better to give people the possibility to look into this change this and and if you change things that could hurt you then then you probably won't do this unless you n feel comfortable doing this like you you also don't open like your open source television and do things in there if you if you feel like you can't can't deal with it so so i think it's I, i'm not sure if one needs to protect but i think it's a it's a it's a interesting question and i totally agree with karen that there's a lot of like uh importance in having the right security measures and avoiding that people accidentally do something that they shouldn't they, they, they do, don't do on purpose that they're just like turning around knobs and suddenly it's not working anymore but so so the design should should prevent that but nothing wrong with them saying okay like i want to change this actually and i'm aware of what i'm doing and yeah so I, that's also my uh, no, this, view on this it. point about control and giving patients control one thing is so okay how uh, it's it's a moment when you patient that other people care about you and suddenly you know you are not allowed to use a knife anymore because you could cut yourself you know and uh, it's actually what it's not what's happening you know for example in this with hearing aids people put it softer and I said also to my uh, I say um, clinician I said this is too loud for me and what you know what it told me you have to get used to it it's good for you you know and then I don't feel good with it but hearing aid, the hearing care doesn't care if I feel good with it because some technicians who never tried out hearing aid by themselves and I think also it's really important stuff try the stuff you develop so I, I tell every developer whatever it is please try it for yourself on one, one day two days a hearing aid you develop it and you will immediately know what the people who are using it, what, what the problem is with, with the hearing aid, you know? Because, um, yeah, for example, you can choose between two programs and say, yeah, do you like more this program? And like, no, this one, but both of the programs, I think they sound somehow the same, you know? And uh, how can I choose then, you know? And then I get the next, next uh, samples and say, are the same again no so there's a lot of like in also especially in interface and in connectivity and in all these kind of things i think that patients could actually take care about themselves you know i i i agree with karen that um i think we can give much more responsibility to to patients that than we are likely to I don't know how it is with, with mental health. Do you have any experience about like the self-determination of life and how your work when, when could help people, help people to have more self-determination with uh, like um, dealing with their mental health? Definitely, I echo what everyone said that giving users the ability to modify the devices to suit personal needs can put users in the driver's seat. And actually, there's a bunch of research showing that engaging in customization um, can enhance user agency and a sense of control. And this can ultimately lead to a, a higher uh, level of self-determination. And this has been um, also uh, found in my previous research on, on mental health, where we found that um, in, like engaging in customizing activities such as 
uh, you know, choosing preferred options or creating idiosyncratic content in these mental health apps uh, can make people feel more uh, fulfilled and satisfied um, and also increase their, their perceived um, autonomy. Um, but I want to say like there's definitely some trade-offs because uh, customization always comes as at a cost of considerable time and cognitive investment. And actually, um, uh, some of previous research shows that like users, they may find that customization burdensome and thus favor uh, just automated systems that uh, demand little user effort. So like that's why a lot of people uh, are quite lazy, like uh, quite, uh, I mean, users, they quite lazy so that they don't uh, touch uh, on the, the app itself and just go with whatever the app default um, suggests because that modifying and playing around these apps are, um, you know, requires uh, a lot of uh, time investment as well as um, high level of digital literacy. Uh, so, yeah, I think um, actually, so our previous research has, has actually found that uh, users' attitudes uh, towards this customization features are really dependent on their own level of di uh, digital literacy and self-efficacy. Um, so, and this uh, led me to think about the potential issues that um, this type of open source uh, devices may um, risk perpetuating and amplifying some digital divide or digital inequality, um, such that people who have who are well educated, okay, have higher level of digital literacy, they are more likely and more a uh, capable of modifying these apps to their um, like to suit their personal needs. Whereas people from a low SES or like um, uh, not a poorly educated they may not have the capability of understanding the very complex algorithm or the features behind this open source uh, data or open source repository, right? And this also may um, um, okay, uh, apply to uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, for those who are older or have lower digital literacy, uh, these doctors, they may, they may hate this uh, new technologies and they don't really wanna work uh, with the patients to modify this to their needs, whereas uh, doctors who uh, who are younger uh, have higher literacy or uh, they grew up with the technologies, like they are more open-minded and are more willing to to, um, to embrace these opportunities. So I think when we are talking about open source um, hardware and software, we might um, need to take into account this very complex issues around. Um, digital uh, divide and digital inequality and be cautious of not um, perpetuating the existing digital divide. Um, so I would love to hear what you think about some of the solutions of encouraging and, you know, empowering people who are less, who are probably from low SES and less educated, have low digital literacy and how we can empower them to, you know, really um, reap the benefit uh, of open source um, health apps. Yeah, maybe just a quick thought that I, that I think it's definitely a valid point, but I think it shouldn't result in everyone having an equally bad experience <laughs> or something. So, so probably one should work on, yeah, figuring out how to increase digital literacy and make interfaces that make it easy to 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 make changes and so on. So this would be a quick quick thought from my side. I always make a Karen joke about my uh, about my heart device that I say, who else but a Karen would ask to talk to the manager to see the source code in her defibrillator, right? Like being able to ask these questions come from a comes from a place of privilege, right? Like I have the you know I've come from a technical background you know, people who have the privilege, who have the luxury time to think about the technology they rely on are as patients in a much better position. I mean, I think the questions you raise are uh, are so fundamental to the inequalities in our various societies that uh, the execution of healthcare has kind of, uh, has exacerbated, which has only been more exacerbated during the pandemic, I might, I might add. And so I think that, that the issues around digital literacy are fundamentally connected to our issues around access to healthcare generally. 
and how do we support people to make sure that they get the health care that uh, they deserve, despite the fact of you know what, whatever resources they're bringing to the table. So it's, it's, I think so too. That is uh, always something we think about. So when 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 I think about an open source hearing aid, that's basically a, where I'm aiming to and working for still, also in the open hearing project, is also I, I think about what's about the hardware. Can I? Is it possible for people in which are not in the Western states to ex, uh, to have access to the hardware? I put my uh, the hearing aid on one thing. The other thing is why is it should be self adjustable. Because you know, uh, where um, in most countries you don't even have audiologists. You know, who who should make the fitting? Who very where is the audio laboratory to make the fitting? They don't exist. You know, so while we're thinking about regulations, in meanwhile there is a lot of people who, yeah, anyway they, they wouldn't have anything, and and it stops us for from from doing something. You know, uh, to to uh, to. Um, yeah, develop our hardware, our software we need. I mean, it's, it's always a general problem about the hardware, you know. With, for example, I was in, in Brazil and I was um, yeah, saying, okay, let's let's make some prototype on, on Raspberry Pi and Arduino. And then as I said, Arduino this is so expensive here, you know, it's so hard to, to uh, import because you have a very high tax on it. So, um, I think um, there's still a lot of uh, like yeah we have to learn about the different um, living situations. We should also like discuss much more about uh, how you say production lines and uh, distribution uh, possibilities, and um, get to in, in much in more intense uh, you know exchange uh, with people in the not Western. Uh, countries because we have I mean we have everything here we don't have to complain it's actually just a luxury problem we have I mean what do you think Joel you, you're nothing like you want to add something well the uh, I mean I, I really think when when you're right and and um, it's it's coming down to a user interface problem really and in terms of designing that user, user interface engineers and testers who are open to a broader cultural um, investigation as to what is the proper way to gauge in order to get the result you want. So it's it's a big problem that is not being addressed. We're still living in a world where most user interfaces are designed by engineers and they're untested. Lots of assumptions go into the way people think people will be dealing with a phone interface or whatever the hell it is. Um, this is getting, I think, a little bit better, but user testing is always the last thing that ever happens on a hardware project. Um, and then Peggy, to get, to address the, um, the point you made about um, accessibility, global accessibility, um, you know, open source hardware and software is about as accessible as you can get because at least the design files and the code is all on the internet and you can get it. Um, but hardware is hard. I spent some time before the pandemic working with a team of um, <clears throat> engineering students in um, Bangalore. They were using my hardware designs for the Timpin project and they wanted to make the hardware there with their local manufacturing base. But the design that I made uh, was I don't want to say too sophisticated, but it relied on a higher level of uh, resolution in the manufacturing process than their manufacturing base could provide. So we worked within the limitations of the contract manufacturers in the region to redesign the hardware so that they could then have it made there locally. Um, open hardware works. Open hardware is accessible, but hardware is still hard. You know, um, so those those kind of problems can be overcome. But then, you know, I freely gave my time and my resources for reviewing their designs, giving them feedback. All of this happening through GitHub on the, online. You know, the process and the the uh, is 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 easier, but still, you need somebody like me who's willing to give away all the stuff and then help you. That's, that doesn't happen very often. Um, I wanted to bring up an example of a 
open source hardware project that's just starting right now. Some uh, engineering students at Olin College in Massachusetts are trying to design an autoacoustic emissions device. This is a diagnostic tool. Um, it sends sound waves into your ear canal, and then it waits for the echo coming back. And you can get a really good indication of cochlea health based on the reflected sound coming back from your ear, inside your ear canal. Um, they want to make an open source one. And we talked last week for about an hour about how to plan for that and what to expect. Um, I told them that certainly they would probably want to open source all of the process and all of the uh, prototyping work that they want to do because that gives people an opportunity to see the process to get some result that works that they can um, modify and work with all on open source hardware platforms, all on open source software platforms so that it becomes more of like a global community can engage. But their actual science or their actual medical device may not be able to be modified. They might be able to show what their source code is. They might be able to show what their hardware files are, but they need to lock down enough of that because this is a diagnostic tool. If you change the tone, frequency, if you change the sound pressure level, you're going to get bad results and you're not going to have a good diagnosis. So here in this case, you know, there's a medical device and there are categories of medical devices where you really don't want to mess with them because you're relying on that tool at its settings to give you diagnostic information or, uh, you know, uh, results that would lead toward a diagnosis. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm about I'm as open source as you can get in a lot of ways. At the same time, I understand the value of regulation and the value of maintaining a tool that does a thing that it says it's going to do. If you want to break it and you want to avoid the warranty, okay, that's fine. That's great. But you don't have that tool anymore. You have a different tool. Um, and right to repair, I think, is really uh, important and critical for, for humans globally to have. Uh, but uh, at the same time, there has to come with it a lot of education about what does it mean to crack open that box, that case, and poke around in what's going on inside. You know, what are, what are your responsibilities that you're taking on when you're doing that? And to address the point you made earlier, Karen, um, we just lived through like two years of some of the worst disinformation health-wise ever, I think, at least that I've lived through. People are taking drugs that clearly don't treat COVID based on bad information that they're getting because they don't trust good information. So, you know, and it, it, if you're going to go ahead and, like, uh, dive into the wind, um, there's not enough real uh, uh, support and real um, consensus for understanding what that actually means. I'll shut up now. Thank you, Todd. Um, so I think we're we coming to, to an end. Thank you all very much for your uh, participation. And I would say, um, I would please everybody to say one short sentence about what they wish for their application, for their work, or for themselves, for the future from open source in health um, hardware or software. So let's start with Daniel. Yeah, I hope that uh, regulation also gets more flexible and reflects the time better because I want everything in the world to be open hardware basically and also medical devices and and then I think the world will be a better place to a big extent. Karen. I can't wait to see what you the audience think of all of these issues that we raised in the panel because you are the ones that will shape the way that our technology will be created. You are the ones who are going to make these choices and you will all we will we're all in the process of becoming and unbecoming cyborgs these issues around what rights do we have with respect to our body it is all of our question and i i i'm so excited to see how this evolves and to see each and every one of you get involved because there's a, a place for you in this field thank you very much karen renman 
Um, so Karen is so well put. So uh, everything, yeah, Karen said I agree with, and also just want to reiterate that uh, we are excited to hear what the audience think about this, especially uh, the sort of really tricky issues we talk about, such as finding a delicate balance between open source and regulation uh, to ensure the safety and effectiveness of, of medical devices and how we can find a sweet spot um, uh, between like uh, providing users with the capability of customizing as well as uh, minimizing and uh, reducing the potential issues of digital inequality. So we're excited to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, Joel, thank you very much, Renan. Yeah, thank you guys so much for this panel. It's really fascinating, very vigorous discussion. I love it. Um, I, I agree. I think see, things should be more open. Things should be more open, definitely. And that's the way that we're going to be able to lift the whole world uh, you know, into a better place, definitely. Thank you all. So I, uh, I actually think that like being impaired or having some issue, having some needs, needs is not something to be desperate or to wait somebody for the help. It's actually the point to get creative, to get your technology in your hands, to, to ask for more like uh, inclusion in, in the developing process, to ask for more like shaping your device, whatever you're dealing with. And if it's because you like it or because you don't know, you, you'll be seen from some people as impaired, but actually you're not, you're just having fun with nice devices. So um, I'm also very curious on, on the question of our um, audience and yeah, see you soon and thank you all very much. And thanks again for inviting us to FOS Asia. It was big fun and really amazing exchange. Bye. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye, thank you.